<laughs> folks. All right. So um, I'm a grad student here in math, a math researcher. And I, I get a lot of questions about what does a mathematician even do? So this talk is going to be both like what do mathematicians think about and a sort of survey of cool math facts to tell your friends in like 15 <laughs> seconds or less. So um, some common things, from, especially from my calc students that I get is, um, as a uh, mathematician, do I do calculus all the time? Like I'm not sitting in my office computing integrals, and I'm also not thinking of bigger and bigger numbers, which was another suggested thing <laughs> that mathematicians might do. Um, for people a little more in the know, a lot of people seem to think that all mathematicians are physicists or statisticians or financiers or engineers. And math is really integrally involved in all those topics too, but I mean, that's not really what a mathematician is. Uh, deep down, mathematicians' primary goal is given just a set of facts, a set of axioms and definitions, our entire goal is to figure out what we can, what, you know, what do we absolutely know from those. And sometimes, based on the axioms we would think were, were good to start with, Turns out you get things that are physically unrealizable. So just to give you an idea, the idea of infinity, this picture is supposed to indicate um, if you counted every single subatomic uh, sub molecule in the entire universe, that's still smaller than all of the positive whole numbers. So <laughs> the absolute smallest infinity is bigger than anything that's physically realizable across the entire universe. And that's not even the biggest infinity. There's infinities above infinities above infinities. Even the real numbers, so all of the decimals, are much bigger than the set of fractions. Um, and if you're working in these larger infinities, some crazy stuff happens. For example, this picture here is one of the big paradoxes that comes from treating large infinities the same size as though they were the same size as smaller infinities. So this Banach-Tarski paradox actually states that you can slice up a ball into seven pieces twist them and glue them back together into two balls that are the exact same size as the original one. So you've doubled the mass without ever stretching anything. So this paradox actually led people to uh, reject a huge axiom of math, but really what you're doing deep down is if you're using this infinitely sharp knife, you're cutting up sets into something that doesn't even have a well-defined mass. So you've destroyed mass by being able to slice too many things. So <laughs> in deciding where to cut, we had to make infinitely many decisions, and not just infinitely many, but more like, like an extra large infinity of infinitely many decisions. So this thing is called the axiom of choice, the ability to be able to do infinitely many things. And it actually, uh, to rephrase, by the way, and like a cool fact to tell people, if this was, the axiom of choice was true, you could slice up a pea into finitely many pieces and reassemble it into something the size of the sun. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, this actually, this axiom, eventually led to a divide in mathematics during the early like 20th century. So this is David Hilbert, who uh, essentially set the, uh, the mathematical agenda for the past 100 years. So it, it's not saying that this is untrue, but it means that the real world has a different set of rules than mathematicians thought. So this is sort of a math intermission fact, by the way, just segueing away from that. This statement, anytime you map a ball into itself, one point stays fixed. You could rephrase this. This is just another cool math fact to tell your friends. This is equivalent to if I take a map of Ithaca, crumple it up, and throw it on the ground, a point on the map is sitting above its real world place. So these are, you know, this is something that comes straight out of the axioms, but this one's plausible, whereas breaking up a ball into seven pieces and gluing it into two balls is not. <laughs> so, all right. These are just some fun math facts, but these are things that don't seem very realizable. So, it's often the case that when mathematicians are working and they set up a problem, statements are really easy to make, but really, really, really hard to compute. So for example, in terms of real world things, a question that gets asked is, let's say, how many people would you need to have like, three mutual friends and three mutual stra or three mutual strangers in a group? So these, are, um, these little nodes mean two people know each other if they're connected by red, and they don't if there's no connection. So it turns out if you have six people, Three of them either have never met any of them or three of them know each other. So you can see if nobody knows each other, there are three mutual strangers. And over in that third one, there's both a group of three people that know each other and a group of three people labeled in blue who don't. So these numbers are called Ramsey numbers. Like how many people would I need to have to guarantee N people either have never met any of each other or all know each other as a group? It sounds like a really easy thing to state, but a mathematician, um, Paul Erdish, had a good response to this. Uh, suppose aliens were going to invade Earth, and like they told us they would destroy everyone on Earth in a year if we couldn't compute the fifth Ramsey number. So that's how many people it takes to have five mutual friends or five mutual strangers. 
we could marshal the world's fa best minds and fastest computers, and uh, within a year we could probably get it. If they demanded the sixth Ramsey number, we would have no choice but to kill all the aliens because there's no other way we're getting that number. So these problems that are really easy to state can be ridiculously difficult. So this is the type of stuff mathematicians think about. And uh, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out and take care.